Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I want to welcome everyone here and want to express my appreciation for your interest in the things of God. I know that we'll um, benefit from our message today because it is based on the Word of God. And God says that His Word will not return to Him without accomplishing the purpose for which He sends it. So I trust that we'll be blessed today. And if you will be taking your Bibles, and I'm going to give you a moment or two to be finding the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel. The Old Testament book of 2 Samuel. And we'll be looking um, today at chapter 23. So that might take you a little while to find that. But in the meantime, uh, I'd certainly like to uh, pause for just a moment and express um, my appreciation for uh, those who have had a part in serving in our military in one form or, or another. And um, on this uh, Memorial Day weekend, I think it's only appropriate that uh, we honor those, uh, those veterans that are among us. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, those who have served in the military in any capacity, just take a stand and, and let us uh, recognize you for a moment. Just stand up if you've served in our nation's military. All right, let's give all these folks a, a, a round of applause. We appreciate your service. We're thankful for what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. There you go. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. We miss Brother Jim. Uh, but it's good to have you all here today. And uh, I want to talk to you this morning on this passage from 2 Samuel chapter 23. It's uh, going to be about um, David's mighty men. In fact, that's what this whole chapter is about. Chapter 23 of the book of 2 Samuel is all about David's mighty men. They're mentioned back in verse 8 here as uh, the list of these names begins. And it says, these are the names of the mighty men of David. So we've got a long list. Some of these names I'm glad I don't have to try to pronounce today. I'll just leave that to you. But that's what this whole chapter is about. And if you've not read anything about David's mighty men, you really need to understand something about these men that the Bible speaks of. These men were a group of highly trained soldiers, and um, they fought with David for most of his um, uh, days of battle before he became a king. They aided David in many of the victories that he achieved with God's help. These mighty men... The Bible speaks of, they were, they were really what we might call today an elite group of soldiers. Um, they were the elite of the elite. They were the, um, the, the Navy SEALs, I guess we could say. Um, the, the, the few good men, the, the Green Berets. But whatever you wanted to call them, they were exceptional warriors and they were loyal to David all their lives. And they would fight for David and even lay down their own lives in order to help their king. So now among these mighty men of David, there's one in particular that I want to think about today. And um, as these men are singled out in this chapter, let's just remember, these were the guys that constituted David's bodyguards. So David uh, could trust in these men, confide in these men. He felt safe and secure as long as these men were around these men were his personal attendants, uh, and he surrounded himself with, with their um, military expertise. These men, as I said, were willing to die in a, in a moment for their king. Now, Memorial Day is a, a special day that we set aside as a nation when we Americans pause to remember those who served in our military, who were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice who gave their lives in service to this country. That's what this weekend is all about. It's not just about barbecues and ball games and what have you. It is about recognition. It is about honor. And that is remembering those who served in our nation's military. It is a day when we honor those who stood their ground against the advancing enemy. Most of America's wars were not preemptive wars, they were defensive wars. In other words, we would rise up and go to war when we were attacked or when we saw that there was a substantial threat 
to the interests of our nation, even though we would fight those wars on other nations' soils. There are thousands of Americans who died defending some hill, defending some bunker, storming some beachhead, or destroying some bridge. And it would do us well to remember the sacrifices that many of these soldiers were willing to make because they did indeed pay the ultimate sacrifice. Standing up not only for themselves and for their their buddies in the trenches, but also for others back home. And they were thinking of us, and it's only uh, proper that we should at least take a day to think about them and the service that they rendered to our country. There are cemeteries all over the world where American heroes are buried, not just in the United States, not just over there in Arlington, but throughout the world, Um, in the Philippines and in other places, in Europe. American soldiers have their graves there. Not that they intended to be buried there, but it just happened because of the need for war. But they were willing to take the battle to the enemy, and that's why they were over there and not fighting here. And they did this in order to take a stand for democracy, freedom, and the liberties that we enjoy and yet sadly so often take for granted. Now, as I said, I want to focus on one of these three mighty men today, and his name is Shama. His name is Shama, so I want you to get used to hearing this name. That's the man that we're going to be talking about. He is mentioned here in verses 11 and 12. Here is a man who was willing to take a stand against tremendous odds, overwhelming odds, and he won a great victory with the help of Almighty God. He was a man from whom we can learn a lot of important lessons today. So let me just read a couple of verses for you out of 2 Samuel chapter 23. All right, first, in verse 11, this is where we begin. After him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite, The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field. So here is this guy in the middle of a pea patch, and he sees the enemy approaching. Everybody else who sees him, the enemy coming, well, what do they do? They they run away. Verse 11 tells us, the people fled. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, right there in the middle of the bean field. He defended it, and he killed the Philistines. And I like this last sentence. So the Lord brought about a great victory. So I want us to take a microscopic view for just a few moments about this guy and about what he did for the kingdom and for the cause of God. Because I see that there are some lessons that you and I need to be reminded of, especially during this time, that we are here in the United States of America and there are so many things that are going on. We just need to be reminded of some things, especially if we're believers, if we're Christians, and we have taken our stand for Christ. We need to remember, first of all, as I've indicated, that we do encounter an unwanted conflict. Whether we like it or not, Uh, Whether we agree with it or not, we are in a time of great conflict here in the United States of America. And this is especially true for believers, those who believe in the Word of God, those who believe in the existence of God, those who stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in a time of great conflict. And it is focused on those spiritual principles that I've just mentioned to you. So we need to understand something here about our enemy because we all are facing a very powerful enemy. First of all, as I speak of our enemy, I'm speaking primarily of our enemy who is spiritual in nature. I'm talking about the spiritual enemy that we face as believers. Now, if you're a Christian, you need to know that there is a turf war going on right now. Every Christian who is determined to live for the Lord Jesus Christ is a warrior. And we need to look at ourselves as a soldier, a soldier of the cross, a warrior, if you will. Because every one of us who took a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ sometime in the past, 
must take our stand today and defend our inheritance that we have in God. We must defend that vital place of influence and, uh, and service for the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of our rights as Christians are being called into question and even stripped away from us, even as I speak. But when I speak of our enemy, I'm talking about this sinister enemy that we call Satan. He may not be as visible as the Philistines were, But I assure you that he is just as real and he is just as powerful as the Philistines ever were. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, and I'd like you to turn, if you will, to chapter 6 of the book of Ephesians. Because there in verse 12, Ephesians 6, 12, we're told specifically that all of us as believers are involved in a war. We are facing an enemy and the Bible teaches this enemy is spiritual in nature. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, but rather we're fighting, the Bible says, against authorities, against rulers, powers of this dark age or this world. In other words, we're, we're uh, pitted against spiritual forces of evil because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that this enemy that I'm speaking of, Satan, has some mighty powerful allies as well. So that means that we're facing an unholy trinity. First, of course, we're, we're facing Satan, the devil. We're facing the world, and often the world is against us. We ought to be against the world, amen? Because if you're not at outs with the world, you're not in with God. The Bible says if you're a friend of the world, or if you love the world, you don't have the love of God in you. And so we need to understand that the world is against Christians, Now let me just pause long enough and let that sink in. The world is against Christians. 1 John 5 and verse 19 tells us that the whole world lies under the sway or under the power of the evil one. So there's no question that this world that the Bible speaks of, I'm not talking about the world of people necessarily or the the world of nature. I'm talking about this world system of ideas, ideals, philosophies, values, actions, attitudes. All of these things are not in harmony with the principles of God's Word. That's why the world stands against us, and therefore we stand against the world. But there's also another enemy. I said Satan has some allies. Of course, he uses the world to defeat us and to discourage and distract us. But we also face the internal enemy, the flesh the Bible speaks of, those desires and those passions that are not in harmony with the will of God. They're not consistent with what God wants for us. They're desires and passions that that we, we should not indulge in. So the fact is, friend, we're facing this, as I said, this unholy trinity. There's Satan, there's society, and there is self. There is an enemy beneath us. There is an enemy around us. The world, there is an enemy that is inside us, and that's the flesh. And every single day, we are locked in mortal combat with these enemies that I'm speaking of. And let me say this, too, that we're also facing a very strategic enemy. Don't think for a moment that Satan doesn't know what he's doing. Because he is very subtle. He is very sinister. And he is strategic in his methods. I want you to notice here in the passage that I'm looking at. In verse 13, we're told about when the Philistines would come and attack the people of God. And what is mentioned there in verse 13, this time of harvest is important. The Philistines would would many times launch their attacks during the time of harvest. That is, when the Israelites would go out into the field just to take care of business, just to get the crops in, that is when the enemies would find them in the field, bending over to pick the peas from the pea plants, the lentils, the beans, and what have you. And then the enemy would launch a surprise attack. That was the strategy. They exploited the element of surprise. And you know something? That is also true with the enemy that we face. Satan loves to attack believers when we least expect it. He's like candid camera, you know. And uh, he likes to come at a time when we are occupied with busy work. 
You see, we can be doing a lot of good things, but if we're not prepared for battle against this powerful adversary, that is when Satan likes to launch his attacks against you and me. He wants to catch us off guard. Can I get an amen to that? He wants to do this so he can gain a foothold in our minds and in our hearts so he can work his ruin in our lives and defeat us. Listen, the most important thing about a person is not how busy they are, but how they're busy. That's the most important thing about a person. And what we need to do as God's people, we need to start building our schedule around the demands of Christ instead of trying to fit Christ into our schedules. We get that reversed a lot, don't we? And the church cannot be as strong as it needs to be as long as we've got church members that are simply trying to squeeze Christ into our busy schedules. That's not the way it's supposed to work. Things that matter the most should never be at the mercy of those things which matter the least. But we suffer from the tyranny of urgent things. And when those good things interfere with the best things in life, then those good things become bad things. And what I'm saying is that we're facing an enemy that will like to catch us by surprise. When we're not expecting, when we're very busy with all of these other things that we're doing. We need to keep our guard up. Amen? 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 tells us that we're to be serious-minded and alert because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, we should be busy, but we should never be so busy that we fail to stay prepared for the attack of the enemy. And I can tell you, friend, that the enemy is coming. Coming for me, coming for you, coming for all of us, who have named the name of Jesus Christ. Think about why the enemy came for a moment. In the the passage before us, we see that the enemy came for at least two reasons. Number one, to destroy the crops. Number two, to destroy life, to inflict casualties. You see, the Philistines knew that if they could weaken the Israelites by starvation, they would be easily defeated. So these troops would march through the fields, trampling down the crops... And then they would slaughter everybody who stood in their way. And may I say to you this morning that not only did the Philistines come with that motive, but our enemy, the devil, also comes with those same sinister motivations in view. He comes at us for the same two reasons. Number one, to inflict casualties among the people of God. And number two, to destroy the crop, that is, the field of God, the things that belong to God. He wants to do this so he might weaken us. And once he weakens us, then we're a lot easier for him to enslave against our will. And the Bible speaks of people whose minds and wills are enslaved by the will of Satan. But I'll tell you what. Today I can tell you that the devil and the world doesn't mind us being here at church today. They don't mind us singing and and praying and taking the Lord's Supper and listening to preaching and sleeping in the pews. They don't mind us doing any of that. In fact, a lot of us are right where the devil wants us. But you let the church get serious about serving God. You let the church get aggressive when it comes to spreading the name of Christ, witnessing and talking to other people about the Lord, and that's when the devil gets nervous, you see. As long as we're casual about our commitment to Christ, we're no threat to Him. You see, the people out here in the world that are living it up today, they're getting drunk, they're getting high, they're getting, you know, they're getting all wiped out for one reason or another, immersing themselves in the pleasures and the projects of this world. The devil's got them right where he wants them. He's not going to waste too much of his energy on them. But you let a Christian start getting serious about serving Christ, and that's when trouble will come. You let people start coming down the aisles, and you let the people of God get encouraged and excited about serving Jesus, and trouble is on the way. You let our members get burdened about speaking to the lost, about people going to hell, and you let our members start talking to others about the Lord Jesus Christ and what Christ has done in their lives, and I'll tell you what, trouble is just around the corner. Whenever we decide to get really passionate 
about serving God and take a bold stand for Christ, the devil will really get nervous. And that's when he gets the busiest. So you can look out because in times like that when things are going good and and Jesus Christ is is being honored and we're praising God and things are going well and we're all serious and we're all committed to the Lord, that's when the devil will decide to invade our pea patch and trample our crop down. Now I want to tell you something else. We see why the enemy comes. We see when the enemy comes. But let me show you something else. Here's what the enemy found. When the enemy came, what does the Bible say? When the enemy, the Philistines, came to fight against Israel, what did they find? Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. Nobody was willing to fight. All the people had fled from the scene. So the enemy comes in and he finds no opposition whatsoever. Don't you know that makes Satan happy? Whenever the people of God don't oppose the things that he wants to shove down our throats... He just loves it. Because there's nothing that tickles him more than for Christians to sit over there in their little dark, quiet corner and not say a word. They want, he wants to see us run. He wants to see us run scared. And I want to tell you what. Too long we've been doing that, people. This is why many churches today are falling apart Because their preachers don't have any backbone. Because their preachers have a yellow streak running down their back and they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But they ought to be more concerned about offending God by their silence. We've got a lot of churches that are ready to shut their doors because they're not taking a bold and courageous stand for Christ. They don't want to upset the apple cart, rock the boat. Might run off a person or two. We're afraid to do that now. We really are. And I want to tell you something. This is probably why, in large measure, approximately 75 churches are closing their doors every week in the United States of America. I want to ask you something. If we were to take a vote here at Oak Grove Christian Church, whether we should shut our doors or not, how would your vote go? You know something? We're witnessing an alarming, fundamental transformation of the United States. Let me just give you a sampling from this past week's headlines. ABC primetime comedy mocking Christianity and exposing kids to sexual conversation and profanity. The Real O'Neills centers around an Irish Catholic family dealing with a son who came out as gay and parents getting a divorce. Now this program was produced by Dan Savage who is an LGBT activist who is known for verbally ridiculing the religion of Jesus and the followers of Christ. Prime time television. Thank you, ABC. Here's another one. Christian students at Duke refuse to read LGBT porn novel. What? Well, thank God for the youth that dare to take a stand for Christ and refuse to read such garbage when none of their other friends would take such a stand. I'll tell you, that's when a student can experience the power and the presence and the peace of God when they're taking a stand for Jesus Christ, even if nobody else is standing with them. Here's another headline. Did you see it? FCC, the government institution which regulates content on United States television, has been proposing changes to its guidelines which would allow more sex vulgarity and profanity during earlier hours when children are more likely to be watching. But thank God, the good news is, a conservative group urges the... And why is it always conservatives? Maybe that's why the world doesn't like conservatives or anybody who holds to conservative values. The American Family Association urges the FCC to keep standards of decency and not loosen up those guidelines. Kudos to them. Here's another one. Just this week, 
Franklin Graham rails against $60,000 awarded to fifth grade transgender teacher offended by pronouns. Pronouns. Leo Soil, fifth grade teacher in Oregon, was compensated $60,000 after filing a complaint saying that her co-workers continually use the wrong gender pronouns when addressing her. Way to go, Leo. Here's another headline. Annie Graham Lott, Lotz says America is entering the last stage into the abyss of God's judgment. Folks, let's be praying that she's wrong about that. But what are we going to do about things like this? God give us some shamas who will dare to take a stand against such things who will dare to stand in the gap for the United States of America, who will dare to take a stand for our communities, our churches, our families, who will stand up, Christians who will show up, and Christians who will speak up. It's been said that silence is sometimes golden, but I would add that sometimes it's just plain yellow. Too many of God's people are giving up ground, deciding to flee rather than stand and fight. And this is exactly what the Philistines found when they came against the people of God. They found nobody. No one except one man, Shama, who stood in the middle of that pea patch and said, "Uh Uh-uh, you'll go no further. You're not going to defeat the things of God, and you're not going to destroy the people of God. It'll be over my dead body before you do that. And so he stood right there, courageously in the midst of the bean field. He took a stand, and that's exactly what we need to do. Amen? But I'll tell you something. We're not going to do it unless we can muster up some courage. Courage is sort of a a virtue that is becoming as extinct as the lumbering brontosaurus. We don't hear much about that today. But verse 12 says that this man alone, he stood, he stationed himself in the middle of the field. And there was a reason why that he was willing to do that. I mean, you might ask the question, why is there such a fuss over a bean field? How important can that be? Well, because you see, he was willing to do this in order to defend the people of God. That's what it was all about. Lentils were a basic staple in the Middle Eastern uh, area. They, They were rich in nutrients. They were beans, rich in nutrients. And he knew that without food, God's people would starve to death. So that field needed to be defended. Even if nobody else would, he was going to do it. To defend the people of God. And also, he took a stand in order to defend God's property. Now, in and of itself, a pea patch really wasn't much to defend, except for one fact. This was God's land. This belonged to God. And that's what made this important. I want to tell you something. Your place in the kingdom of God is important. Don't insult God by saying He can't use you, that you have no place here, that you have no work to be done here, that you have no purpose here, because you do. And your place is vitally important. You have a work that needs to be done. You have a work that must be done. You have a work that won't get done unless you do it. Your place in the kingdom of God is very important. And if your place, your life, your family, your influence, and your future wasn't so important to God and His kingdom, there wouldn't be a battle raging over it right now. He wants to defeat us. He wants us out of His way. I'm talking about Satan. He wants us to be closed up. He wants us to be just silent and brushed aside. And that's what he's trying to do. But you know something? There was in that day and there always will be some things worth fighting for. I wonder if we've forgotten that. Our soldiers who went to war against the Japanese who attacked us, The Germans who declared war on us. The terrorists. I wonder if the people who were willing to risk their lives would be ashamed of people today. 
We get mighty weary of war, don't we? We don't like it. And that's understandable. But you know something? There will always be things worth fighting for. And I've always said it's, fight, it's right to fight as long as you fight for what's right. And as long as there's what's right, then there's a reason to fight. But you know something? You can tell today that we're losing ground as a Christian movement. Just take a look at some of our public schools and universities and you'll see some lost ground. This time of year we usually hear stories about commencement speeches and speakers and some school faculty or administrator denies a student the right to mention God or the name of Jesus or the right to pray in the name of Jesus or the right to pray at all. We can't say those things. Out in California, we can't bring a Bible to school in the elementary grades, but the schools will provide a room for prayer for Muslim students. We don't get one. Tell me there's no bias against Christians today. Today in this nation, you can lose your job for offending a minority or for speaking against blatant immorality. It's open season on Christianity. The Ten Commandments, prayer, taken out of our schools, taken out of our public buildings, banned. We can't have any of that. There's the field of biblical literacy that needs to be defended. How much of God's Word do we, do we really know today? We don't know much about our Bibles, and that accounts for why we don't share our faith with people like we should. The prophet Hosea once said in Hosea 4 and verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, at any time we can spew out details and the, the pettiest information about March Madness, who's in the brackets, fantasy football, fashion, the money market, newest phone apps. We can talk about that till. Till we're blue in the face, but we can't talk about the teachings of God's word and truth because we generally just don't know it. We don't spend enough time in God's word. There is a field that needs to be defended. The field of Bible knowledge. We need to get back to the book. Now, I'm not saying anything's wrong with some of those things I've just mentioned, but we should not allow these things to ever displace a knowledge of God's word. You know, there's also the field of spiritual passion. Too many of us are too content to be mediocre. In Titus 2 and verse 14, we're told that Jesus died in order to purify for himself a people zealous for good works. What does that mean? People eager, desirous to do good works. And yet, many of us are just spiritually sound asleep. And so what we have here today is many Christians being stuck in the rut of mediocrity, average Christianity, which is no Christianity at all. People sometimes say, you know, I don't like Christianity because it sounds too radical. Good. Now you're beginning to understand the real nature of the religion of Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, I'd rather serve that Jesus who was meek and mild, you know, the one that looks so effeminate that it appears that he just walked out of a beauty parlor somewhere. He would never offend anybody, would he? Take a look at what the world did to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, here's what we need to do. We need to get excited about the things of God. The Bible says that we should be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. We ought to be faithful in our worship. We ought to be fervent in our praying. And we ought to be faithful in witnessing to other people. These things are so important that they're literally worth dying for. Amen? Now don't say it unless you mean it. Because if you're not willing to live for these things, you're certainly not willing to die for them. Where are the shamas who will dare to take a stand and fight for the glory and the honor of God? We can't afford to sit on the sidelines any longer. We have lost too, far too much ground. So I ask you, are you courageous like Shama? I told you what courage is. Courage is not something that exists in the absence of fear. Courage is actually the mastery of fear. 
It's, it's uh, fear that said its prayers. God wants to see that courage. You say, where does the Bible say that? Try this one. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, Peter tells us that there are some virtues that we should add to our life as Christians simply because God has delivered us from the corruption of this world. Peter says that we're to add to our faith virtue. That's courage. The fortitude to take a stand for what's right and to stay there. That's courage. The Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-discipline. And if God is for us, who can be against us? We need a courageous group of believers who will dare to stand up for Jesus. So let's decide that we're going to be Christ's mighty men and women who will stand for what's right, whose faith is like steel and whose fortitude is unwavering. Let's be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. If we want to win the victory, that's what it's going to take. We've got to arm ourselves with the, with the weapons that God provides. We've got to stand our ground. We've got to fought, fight for the cause of Christ. Or else the enemy will gain further ground. And it may just come one day that preaching the gospel will be criminalized. And I know with the very suggestion of that, some, some of us here think, oh, that'll never be. I never thought Christian, Christians could get the trouble and the harassment that they've gotten. I've never thought that Christian preachers could get in so much legal trouble simply for speaking out against certain Bible topics. But they have. Lawsuits have abounded. A certain group got offended. Got their feelings hurt. Suffered some kind of emotional trauma. And now preachers are facing lawsuits. In other countries, preachers are thrown in jail. Just this week, the Prime Minister of Canada said that speaking anything against transgenders ought to warrant two years in prison. And by the way, Canada has a list of hate literature... And do you know what's on it? Hate literature. I know of where one preacher was put in jail, preacher in Toronto, simply for quoting Bible verses without comment. He read verses like Leviticus 18.22, 1 Corinthians 6, 10 and 11. And he was put in jail for that, quoting the Bible. So how far are we from nonsense like that? Well, I'll tell you what. If we do exhibit unusual courage and we realize that there is an unwanted conflict, one that we didn't ask for, one that we didn't want, but one that we must fight nonetheless, we will enjoy an undoubted conquest. Notice that the Lord defeated the enemy. The Bible says here, in verse 12, the Lord brought about a great victory. You know, a lot of people would look at Shama standing in the middle of that bean field saying, look at him, he, poor guy, he's all alone. No, whenever you take a courageous stand for Christ, friend, you are never alone. Because Jesus Christ is standing there with you. And the Bible teaches that the battles we face, the battle is the Lord. So Shammah was simply the one that was wielding the sword, but God is the one who gave him the victory. And that is the way we obtain victory today. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. And we are more than conquerors through Christ. God will give us the victory if his people will dare to stand up for what's right. If we don't, friends, who's going to? If we don't stand up with, for the Bible, then who's going to guide them to heaven, the lost? If we don't stand up for the right to pray in the name of Jesus, who's going to stand in the gap and intercede for this country who needs prayer desperately? And if we don't witness to the Lord, uh, people about the Lord Jesus, listen, who's going to do it? We ought to do it today because it might not be legal tomorrow. Shama dared to defend a plot of ground. 
And that might not sound like a very significant thing for him to do, but I'll tell you what, that single action on his part is what turned the tide of the war. And what you do as a Christian in these troublesome, turbulent times of conflict can turn the tide of this spiritual warfare I'm talking about. God is looking for more Christians who will hold the high ground, men and women who will dare to take a stand and not back down. The Lord is looking for shamas today who will defend the faith, who will, to, who will defend the faith and they'll be earnestly contending for that faith as Jude tells us over in verse 3, who will stand firm in the battle for the Bible. God help us find more shamas who will not concede the harvest to the enemy. God help us find more children of God who will station themselves in God's field and not yield and will not allow the enemy to steal the harvest or our inheritance. God, give us somebody, and may we be that person who will say, not on my watch, not now, not in my town, not as long as I have breath in my body, not as long as the Lord is on my side. I'm going to stand up, I'm going to show up for the battle, and I'm going to speak up. And there's no force under heaven, and certainly no forces out of hell that can keep me quiet about what's at stake here. So I'm asking you, where do you stand today? Are you content to flee and do your thing, go through the motions, and just be content with coming to church, hear a sermon, sing a few songs, and pray a few prayers, and then that's it, lunch! And forgetting about all these things through the rest of the week, is that, is that your mentality? Is that your attitude? Or are you willing to take a stand for God and speak up about the issues that are at stake here? You know what? I found that the, uh, the enemy and the people who are within the enemy's ranks, they're not ashamed of speaking up. Why, well, you've got Hollywood celebrities, musicians. You've got all these people that are boycotting our state right now because we don't believe the same way they do. How do you define a bigot? You see, friend, it's not the conservative causes that are the real censors in this country. It's those who are willing to shut down our free speech rights by sitting in the middle of a road and denying access. Those who will not just protest but riot violently just so that people who believe something different from them can have a chance to speak their mind. Haven't we come a long way, baby? And we've got those folks up there in the highest positions of our land who are willing to defend that kind of thing. That would go over well in communist Russia, but not here in the United States. No, uh uh-uh. So I'm asking you, will you stand in the pea patch today? Will you fight? Will you engage yourself in the battle of the bean field? And will you stand your ground even when nobody else is there to fight with you? Will you stay in the pea patch Let me close with one scripture. 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9. Here it is. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. I ask you this morning, will He find that kind of heart in you? Are you fully committed to Christ? Or are you just playing games? You know, we sometimes wonder why when we're attacked by radical Islam, why moderate Muslims don't stand up and speak out against that. But you know what I wonder? I wonder why so many moderate Christians don't stand up and speak out for what's right. You know, we have a silent majority right here. Maybe we need to be thinking about our own lack of involvement, our own lukewarmness. And resolve that with the help of God, we're going to be shaken free 
from the spell of complacency that has kept us embalmed and stiff and inactive for so long. Some of us need to make a change. Do you need to make a change today? If, listen, if you're not a child of God, Jesus is inviting you to take full advantage of the blessings of His grace and His mercy and receive forgiveness of sins and become a new creation in God. And if you come to God just as you are, He will make someone beautiful, someone productive and fruitful, and your life will be immeasurably, immensely blessed. But you've got to take that stand for Jesus. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross. That's radical talk. Cross was an instrument of death. And follow me. Are you willing to die for Jesus? Better yet, are you willing to live for Jesus? Are you willing to live like Jesus wants you to live? Hey, maybe you're a member of this church and you've just not been as active and and standing up for what's right and and you've just sort of been playing games for a little while. Listen, you can come back to God today and He will abundantly pardon. He will freely forgive. And He will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And you can start over and be just as pure in the eyes of God as you were the day you came into this world. The Bible says if we confess our sins, talking to Christians... God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can do that today, and you ought to do that today. We're going to be singing this song of encouragement for you. That is number 681, just the first and the last verses. And if you have a decision to make for the Lord Jesus Christ, take your stand and declare your allegiance to Jesus who died for you. And don't ever back down. Don't ever back up. Don't ever back away. And Jesus will reward you at the end of the way. Well done, good and faithful servant. God needs soldiers of the cross in these days. Won't you be one of them? While together we're standing and singing this.